so I'm very pleased that we've uh, we're continuing our journey this year. This year we're journeying through the Buddha's Noble Eightfold Path and we've arrived at the start of a new term when we will be looking at the last two stages of the Eightfold Path, perfect mindfulness now and then later on this term uh, perfect samadhi. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of an overview. Some of this will be familiar uh, which is a good thing, I hope, so that you can sort of get an orientation if you've been following it through the year. And just to say a little bit about mindfulness as a stage of the Eightfold Path. So, here we go. This is how the stages of the Eightfold Path unfold. And for those of you who, who were here back in January, in that first term of the year, we were looking at vision, which is the crucial first stage of the Eightfold Path. And um, what that really is about is how every, all our spiritual paths have started with a glimpse of something. Um, it might not actually be a visual glimpse, it might have been a felt sense, it might have been a, something that called us or drew us to start to practice in whatever way we're practicing. In, in, it's, it's an indispensable uh, aspect of what actually sets us out on the spiritual journey however it goes for us we all share some sense of vision or glimpse of something more than something we want to move towards in our lives and we spent the first term of the year really exploring that along with making our way on alternate weeks through um, uh, a level two meditation course to really firm up our meditation practice and all through the summer we've been exploring action of body, speech, and mind in various ways. So this covers five stages. That covered five stages of the path: perfect emotion, perfect speech, perfect action, perfect livelihood, and perfect effort. And the way that we did that was uh, looking at effort, um, action in terms of ethics, action in terms of ritual and devotion. That was acts of body, speech, and mind, devotional acts and also activism um, and altruistic activity. So that's what we've been doing for quite a few months now over the summer. And um, this evening marks the start of the seventh limb or stage of the Eightfold Path, perfect mindfulness. And as I say, that will be followed later on this term, perfect samadhi. Here we are. Just wanted to remind you that the Eightfold Path isn't just a linear path. Uh, you can also see them as eight limbs. And we've got this lovely tree from, that Yasmin drew us at the start of the year, which just really illustrates how we've got each of these different aspects that can be seen um, as the limbs on a tree or the petals on a flower. So we've been working our way around from the left and we've got to perfect awareness or perfect mindfulness. And I wanted to give you a little visual. Don't be shocked about this. <laughs> Uh, and if you're not familiar with the terms I'm talking about, you can just get a general sense of, of um, the pattern I'm looking at here. We use the word mindfulness a lot these days, and there's a lot of secular mindfulness. And mindfulness is a term that's been used in the Buddhist tradition for a very long time. And I wanted to give us a sense of the relationship between the two, because there's an overlap, but they're not the same completely. And um, this rainbow that we've got on the right describes the fact that life, conditionality, as the Buddha described our experience of life, has lots of different levels to it. There's the level of physics and organic, there's the level of biology and animal and human life, there's the level of psychology. Then there's the level when we become aware of our actions and their consequences, a kind of self-reflexive awareness, which is where the law of karma starts to come in, where dharma practice really, really starts to uh, come into play. And then beyond that level of the um, conditionality, which is our actions and their effects in the world, there's another level of conditionality that the dharma works in, which is a profound level of conditionality, which is beyond the grasp of the rational mind. The nature of reality the rational mind can reach towards it, but it can't wholly grasp it and reduce it to rational concepts. So the reason why I've used this rainbow isn't because the colours have a great symbolic significance of their own, but just to describe there's this whole complete spectrum of experience which mindfulness can attend to. And then on the left, I've just got this little illustration that with secular mindfulness, um, you might be attending to, to things, physical objects, 
to your biological, physical experience, your physical health, and indeed your psychology, your mind. And some aspects of secular mindfulness might tend into the whole area of ethics and karma, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes the applications of mindfulness in a secular sense only go as far as psychology. So you can find that mindfulness is applied, for example, mindfulness in the military, which doesn't necessarily take ethical considerations from a Buddhist perspective into view. So what, the reason I've offered this, this little diagram is to illustrate that the secular mindfulness is a, is a very important aspect of life and it's fantastic that there's so much more mindfulness in the world and it's a very very important foundation for many of us and as an aspect of the eightfold path perfect mindfulness goes further than that it builds upon it it enables us to have an awareness of our ethical actions of karma of our actions and their consequences and it also enables us to begin to develop an awareness of reality, that reality which is beyond the grasp of our rational minds. Um, and these are all things that will gradually come out over the next few months. So I just wanted to share with you, uh, so you can understand clearly, when the Buddha talked about uh, perfect mindfulness or awareness, he'd have said samasati, that's the Pali on the right there, or in Sanskrit, Samyak Smriti. So the Sama part, Samyak or Sama, it's sometimes translated as right, right mindfulness. But Sangrachita encouraged us to think beyond that because it's not right as opposed to wrong. This word Sama or Samyak means proper, whole, thorough, integral, complete or perfect. And he chose to use the word perfect, but you get that sense that it's a mindfulness, whole, complete mindfulness. Um, those of you who were here a few weeks ago may remember I talked a bit about mindfulness and I use that beautiful poem that starts, to be great, be whole, do not exaggerate or leave out any part of you. So this is what we're doing with our development of mindfulness as an, as as an aspect of the Eightfold Path. And this word sati or shmuti is translated as mindfulness or awareness, sometimes just as memory or recollection. So that was just to give you a bit of orientation there. And in terms of the Eightfold Path, mindfulness has this crucial role in integrating our energies, in gathering the different aspects of ourselves behind our vision. Um, and those of you who are familiar with the system of practice in Sri Ratna will remember that integration is the foundation of our system of practice. Um, and not only is it about integrating our energies, it's also about broadening our awareness through that whole spectrum of conditionality um, that I illustrated with that slightly complicated but hopefully uh, useful diagram. So when we were thinking about how to do this term, uh, what came to mind was this fabulous book by Maitre Bandhu, Life with Full Attention, a practical course in mindfulness. It's an eight-week course, um, which has been running for quite a long time um, at the London Buddhist Centre. And uh, we're very fortunate uh, to have Surya Daya with us to lead us through this exploration because she was um, able to do a retreat with Maitre Bandhu exploring this material at Adishtana um a few years ago so we've asked Surya Daya to take a lead in um the other thing navigating us through the material in this it is a really um really enriching book and I just wanted to say if you think if you're still thinking or you have thought oh what is all this fuss about mindfulness you definitely need to do this course and if you feel like oh yeah mindfulness I've been there I've done that actually I'm into whatever you definitely, definitely need to do this course. Um, the Buddha was practicing mindfulness on the night he gained enlightenment. Mindfulness, in the sense we've just been talking about, can take you all the way to enlightenment. And the Buddha's last words were, with mindfulness, strive on. So I'm going to hand over to Surya Daya now, who's going to take us, uh, give us a bit of a, a sense of where we're going with the course, and give us a bit of a taster. Yeah, okay. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yes. Yep. Lovely. Thank you very much, Satchalila. That's great. It's really, really helpful. 
First of all, I just want to extend my own very personal welcome to Amla Deepa because she's a very good friend of mine and I am truly delighted to see her here this evening. I hope you all grow to like and love her as much as I do because uh, it's going to be really terrific to, uh, to have you on board, kiddo. Yeah, thank you for coming along. So, yes, as um, uh, Satchalila has just set out, that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be offering this very, very practical course in mindfulness and meditation. And it's, as she says, it's based on Maitreya Bandhu's book. We've put the uh, link up for uh, anybody who wants to know uh, the details. Uh, and this course has been run many, many times in Buddhist centers all over the country, but not as yet in Bristol. And some of us have been wanting to do it for some time. Because there are, there are so many different approaches to meditation and in a way, all of us have to kind of find out what suits us. So we do lots and lots of different things at the Bristol Buddhist Centre, don't we? Including the very successful uh, Wednesday and Thursday meditation classes. We all of us have to find out what suits us. We have to find out what inspires us and what interests us, I think. Because I think if we don't find this kind of key then meditation can begin to fall by the wayside. At least that's my experience. We all of us probably have got expectations about what should be happening. And if we don't get some sort of payoff from uh, meditation, it's very unlikely that we're going to settle into any kind of enjoyable routine. And many of us, I think, I'd suggest, have been at a point where we know that meditation really benefits us. And we know in our hearts that it's something that we want to be able to do uh, and something that will really help us in so many ways. But for a myriad different reasons, so many different reasons, and very often to do with our expectations, I think, we find excuses not to get on the mat and then we find that it's slipping a bit and then we may even find ourselves in a life where meditation is actually playing really rather a small part. We're going along to classes, doing yoga, study and so forth, but meditation isn't actually a sort of a, a regular thing. So if this is you, then stay listening. Um, so, so what, what I'm saying is that, that many of us will fly with meditation uh, and mindfulness. It will come sort of naturally, will fall in and it will become a joy. But uh, many of us will plod and it may never, it may never become the routine and the resource that A, we want it to be and B, it could be. And kind of in the middle, There'll be lots of people for whom it's become a central part of our lives, but perhaps not quite as transformational as it could be. In other words, we're not kind of really getting in there to enable it to deliver up its full potential for us. So I haven't led Maitreya Bandhu's course before, although I have studied with him. And as those of you who know him. He's quite a character. <laughs> He's certainly hugely entertaining, very engaging and a very natural and gifted teacher. So if any of you want to kind of get a sense of who's behind this, then of course there's the book, but you know, just go online and have a, a check in with one of his talks at the LBC. Uh, he's taught a lot, a lot of people. He has a very particular style. Uh, I love it personally. So it's going to be a bit of an adventure for me. And I hope it'll be a learning curve, not only for me, but all of us. Um, because as you know, there's absolutely nothing like trying to teach something to somebody else to make you learn it properly, which was part of my motivation for wanting to sort of uh, get stuck in with this. I really, really hope that we're going to enjoy it. But what really attracts me about <clears throat> my Trey Banjo's approach is that it's highly structured each week builds on the previous week in a very accessible, practical, and yet both profound and also lighthearted way. Um, 
And so, although I'm a very imaginative person, you know, I like the idea of being able to relax and experiment in meditation. I'm actually also the kind of person who likes to have a roadmap um, in any kind of journey or project that I undertake and in anything that I try to learn. Um, I will be asking myself questions, um, you know, like, am I going in the right direction? Have I covered the basics? That's something that came up a lot for me when I was uh, learning meditation for the first time. Have, is there something I've missed? You know, how does this build? What, what should be happening? What can I expect? Is what's happening okay? And maybe even things like, you know, how can I navigate this tricky bit? Uh, is there another route around it? So life with full attention uh, is, I think, just this kind of roadmap. Um, it's full of really great guidance, advice, and above all, it's very, very practical. Lots of exercises and activities. It's sort of people-centered. It's hands-on and it's got a terrific teacher behind it. If we commit to it together, I think, over the next few weeks, and we work together and I learn from you and you learn from me and we learn from each other on the team, then I think it could be a real accomplishment and a joy and interesting to see where it takes us. So over the coming weeks, the four of us will be working through systematically with uh, talks and input, uh, followed by discussions. Then there will also be led meditations and other practices. And there will also be things to take home with us, to take forward into the week. It is very much designed to carry us through our weeks and keep it going day by day. Um, the other thing that we'll be encouraging you to do is to perhaps buddy up if you can find somebody whose face you like and uh, check out your progress with them and you know, reassure yourselves, just, just keep each other uh, going kind of thing. So next week, uh, we'll be kicking off with uh, looking at mindfulness in more detail, this time day-to-day -day mindfulness. Then the following week, mindfulness of the body, big emphasis as, as with all our teachings of meditation on the body, mindfulness of sensations, week three. Then big one, mindfulness of kind of, you know, the inner chatter, the endless gabble of the mind and the mind's activity followed by uh, spiritual teachings in and around the subject. Then a lovely session on mindfulness of the environment and nature. Uh, next, mindfulness of other people in our lives, our relationships with people we know and we don't know, other beings. And then finally, in the eight weeks, there's a whole session on mindfulness of reality itself. And this will come complete with fireworks, loud Pink Floyd music, and a lot of incense, in the middle of which Tara Nita will be dancing around in ethnic clothes while Nara Vera is planning to play the drums. So that's something to really, really look forward to. <laughs> Didn't warn you about that, did I, lads? I'm looking forward to that one. So that's the order of, uh, of play, as it were. And we're hoping very much that you'll commit to it and come along. Um, and if you are feeling at all interested by what I'm saying, then I'd really encourage you to just clock that and seriously think about setting a bit of a, an intention to commit. And in relation to that, I'd say, never ever underestimate the power of simply committing and simply getting your bum on the seat in front of the screen. Uh, it's a powerful, powerful practice there's something else really, really interesting that comes to mind that um, uh, Mike Chobandu says in his book. I said this when we had our initial team meeting. He made this observation about motivation and I thought, oh God, this is so true. He said, we expect to be motivated before we do something. But actually, if you think about it, very, very often, we're not actually motivated until after we've done it. I mean, take, for example, going for a swim. There's not many of us that actually want to go and, you know, take our clothes off in the cold and 
get get in the shower and then jump in the cold water. And it said very much as, oh, I really should, I really ought to, da, 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 da. But as soon as you get out of that pool, you know that you've done something really, really worthwhile, don't you? It's just a very interesting thing to reflect upon. Uh, and well, not, ju not just around this, but you know, all sorts of things in our lives. Motivation doesn't necessarily come first. And yeah, I'd strongly, we would strongly uh, encourage you to get hold of the book. Um, and that's very easy. The link is up. Tim's put it up for us kindly. Um, and I suggest that you leaf through it, you dip into it, you scribble in it, you put red circles around things that interest you, make lots of notes. The book is actually designed that way. Um, use it as a diary, as a notebook. It's very much set up that way and it will hugely supplement and amplify everything that we'll be covering. Befriend the book. So before we just do a little sort of practice exercise before our groups, I'll just give you a wee taste of how Maya ba Maitre Bandu writes and what this book contains. And I've just kind of selected some things from the first chapter to sort of fire us up, if you like, some little nuggets of uh, wisdom as he introduced this whole fascinating subject of mindfulness, which for me, he really, really opened up. Um, I think before I studied with him, read this, did his stuff, I hadn't quite, um, the other person that did that for me was Vidya Mala. They were both leading um, that retreat I was on. So here's some, here's some goodies before we do a little practice. He says, I imagine that most people picking up this book will want to learn how to live more deeply and richly. They will want to develop present tense awareness. I love that phrase, present tense awareness, living in the present tense. I believe that if we want to be happy, if we want to feel that life is going somewhere rather than just going around in circles, then we need to attend to the mind our state of mind filters everything. Another interesting observation. It's very strange to think that of all the things we learn, algebra, geometry, history, geography, all the things we learn, so little is said about the mind and how we experience things. We miss the one thing that absolutely determines whether the holiday in Mallorca is going to be enjoyable or the new job in IT is going to be rewarding or whatever. It's the mind. If we want to experience life more deeply, we need to look at how we live. We want life satisfaction, but what we get, at least in the West, I think, is choice. And we have a strong tendency to believe that more choice leads to more happiness. We easily become paralyzed or we choose badly. We choose things that don't, in the long term, bring lasting contentment. If we want to enjoy things, if we want to experience lasting satisfaction, then we need to be in a state of mind that is receptive enough, clear enough and calm enough to do so. Simply surrounding ourselves with pleasurable objects just won't do it, <laughs> unfortunately. And here's a final favourite, I think, which just about sums the book up. This book follows a journey of awareness from remembering where you put your keys to transcendental insight into the nature of reality. And I'm sure that, like me, you've done the first one a thousand times, i.e. forgotten where you put your keys. Uh, I'm looking forward to doing the second one for the first time with Naravira and Taranita. <laughs> So let's dive in to this whole sort of mysterious and rather wonderful pool of mindfulness and just try a little practice section, session, after which we're going to divide into groups. I hope that Naravira is doing the magic. Um, I think we're going to go into groups for how, how long did we say? 20 minutes? Yeah, about 20 minutes. Uh, this little reflection will be about um, 10 minutes or so. Uh, group, then we're going to groups, and then when we come out of groups, we'll come back in, but we're going to just have a five minute lead stretch uh, before we just go into a quiet, short uh, meditation. Okay?
So get comfortable. Make yourselves comfortable. Lie down, stretch out, relax. Bye bye, Maladipa. Great to see you. See you soon. And just bring yourselves, bring yourselves into a quiet space. Just taking a few nice deep breaths. Relaxing on the out breath. We're going to do a little exercise just in mindfulness, a little investigation. So approach this with a spirit of exploration, of interest, of playfulness. See what's there. You don't need to have a definition of, your, of mindfulness in your mind before you start. You know, the, 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 this, this, it's the experiential aspect of it that will lead us to understand what it is that we're after here. So just relaxing down. First of all, see if you can notice the weight of your body. Where is it falling? The weight, the solidity of you. A sense of yourself as a physical body Are you tightening your thigh muscles? Are you curling your toes? Are you furrowing your brow? Scan around and see if you can notice any tension anywhere and how is that manifesting in your body? Just let your full attention travel around. Your neck, your abdomen maybe. Can you feel the warmth of your clothes? What sensations do you experience where the fabric and the material of your clothes is touching your skin? Are you aware of any texture? Anything pleasant or unpleasant, maybe. Just keeping that awareness washing through. Are there any sounds that you can hear? You're at home. With traffic or birdsong or those noises that the house makes? Or is it silence? And now just open your eyes very slightly and Take a look around you. What do you see? What shapes, what colors? Without thinking about what you're seeing, just try and enjoy, notice. Rest somewhere if it interests you or fascinates you.
colors, how the light is falling. Now, can you smell anything? Take some light breath through your nose. Really sense into it. Probably one of our least conscious sensations, isn't it, smell? And yet such an important one. Taste? Can you taste anything? And now finally, just begin to notice your breath. Don't have to close your eyes, you can if you want to, but just feel the breath in your body. Where do you feel it the most? Is it in your mouth, your throat, or perhaps your chest, front and back, or perhaps your belly, tummy? Just focus on that. Where do you feel it the most? Is it quick or slow? Light or deep? Just take a moment to be fascinated by it. Okay, and now bringing the attention back to the body and the weight of your body again. The pressure. The sense of gravity. And finishing with a couple of deep breaths. Okay, and then coming back. Okay, lovely. Welcome back. So in a moment, we're going to go into discussion groups. And I'm going to suggest that we go in with a couple of questions to maybe explore. Uh, firstly, um, what do you think, what do you or what have you understood by mindfulness? And how does that compare with a little bit of what we've heard this evening. So if you had to explain mindfulness to somebody who didn't 
hadn't come across it, how would you explain it to them? And secondly, in your own life, how and where do you cultivate or experience mindfulness? Can you give any examples of situations, experiences, practices? You know, how does it, how does it sort of feature in your own life? 